Uh, and I wanted to introduce Ann Lowry, who's a professor of colon and rectal surgery at the University of Minnesota. Uh, she uh, did her undergraduate training at uh, Radcliffe College and uh, residency at New England Medical Center. Uh, did her colon and rectal surgery fellowship at the University of Minnesota, where she has obviously advanced to the level of full professor. She has served as the program director for colon and rectal surgery fellowship there. And as well been the president of the Association of Program Directors for Colon and Rectal Surgery and is the past president of the American Society of Colon and Rectal Surgeons. And uh, just to remind you, we do actually read these things that you've put, and one of the most frequent comments last year was requesting someone to speak about perineal and pelvic complications of IBD and how to do medical and surgical combined therapy. So we have the good fortune of Dr. Lowry to speak to us today. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. And it's, I've had a really nice time here the last uh, couple days, gotten to see some old friends and make some new ones. And I'm uh, very impressed by the facility and the program. So it's been, I've learned things, which is, it's always a two-way street. So I hope I can give back a little bit. Um, as Peter said, I'm going to talk about surgical dilemmas in inflammatory bowel disease. Basically, my view is a few philosophic comments. My view about inflammatory bowel disease, maybe all uh, surgical care, is that there's a team approach, and we want the best, all want our be best for our patients. And for inflammatory bowel disease, what that means is that we all recognize that there have been significant advances recently in IBD therapy, but that surgery is sometimes necessary. There is always this tension, and I think particularly in inflammatory bowel disease, it may not be so obvious, it may not be so present here, but it certainly is in many centers, that on the GI side, calling us means that you failed, and on the surgical side, it may mean a little over-enthusiasm about a chance to cut as a chance to cure. And it's balancing that tension that's really important for the patient. Surgical decision-making can some, in many ways be brought down to some very simple questions is do they need an operation? If they do, what operation to do? And what's the best way to do the operation? I'm going to pick some particular clinical scenarios this morning or situations and mostly focus on what operation to do and a little bit on what is the best way to do the operation. I'm sure you have lots of discussions in this forum about whether patients need an operation or what are the indications. And I've picked these three uh, situations, one ulcerative colitis, Crohn's colitis, and then perianal Crohn's disease. And again, just a brief philosophic statement that overview or oversees all of our care, surgical care for IBD patients is first, do they really need an operation? And then if they do, our goal is to preserve bowel and particularly to preserve function. Uh, there are a number of reasons that patients with ulcerative colitis come to surgery, and the comments I'm going to make uh, about the surgical questions of ulcerative colitis really apply the most to the first two indications. I, toxic colitis is a uh, different set of decisions, and I'm not going to focus on that this morning. Can you all see this? Is it dark enough? It's up to you. You're the ones looking, so... Um, the, um, as everyone knows, that patients who have surgery for ulcerative colitis, most of them require a total proctocolectomy, <laughs> and there are a number of options about what to do with the end of the small intestine, and the first two are the most commonly chosen choices, at least in most centers, um, and there is an emerging consensus that because of the ease of the procedure, patient preference, and, um, the results that there's almost near universal adoption of a J pouch. But there's still some questions in the surgical world that are, remain uh, controversial or needing discussion. And one is do we do that anastomosis as a hand sewn anastomosis or a staple? For the hand sewn involves doing a mucosectomy of the distal rectum and then sewing the J pouch to. Uh, the anal canal, 
as stapled is that we staple off the distal rectum, but you can see we're leaving this short cuff of the distal rectum, and then the J pouch is stapled to that rectal cuff. In general, the, it's felt that there's better function with stapling. There's less incontinence and may be related to a better sampling reflex, and that there are more anal problems, both functional problems like the control issues, but also complications like anastomosis and leak, stenosis and leading to more pouch renewal, removal. And there has been a meta-analysis published just a few years ago of a large number of patients comparing these two techniques. And that meta-analysis confirms what people's clinical impressions have been, that if in hand-sewn pouches, there's more likelihood of pouch failure and significantly more functional issues, that patients are more likely to seep at night, they're more likely to need to wear a pad and have even daytime incontinence. So the consensus that's emerging about that is that the staple technique is almost always used. The one discussion point, at least in surgical conferences, is what do we do about patients who have dysplasia in the rectum? And are they still patients that should have a mucosectomy and a hand-sewn anastomosis? Another surgical question is, do all those patients need to be diverted? The standard treatment is either uh, is, has been moving towards a two-stage procedure where patients get the subtotal collect uh, total proctocolectomy and a formation of the J pouch with a temporary ileostomy, and then the ileostomy is taken down. When these first were being done, they were done in three stages where the abdominal colon was taken out, an ileostomy, and a Hartman pouch. Then the J pouch was made, and then the ileostomy was made. We've moved through that to the two-stage procedure, and then now to the question of does everybody need to be <coughs> diverted? And again, I'm only talking about the elective patients. We know that diverting ileostomies have been proven to be useful for emergency surgery. The question is, are they necessary for this? And the arguments in favor of diversion are that it it, while it does not prevent leaks, it decreases the mortality from leaks. It minimizes those functional consequences of leaks. In addition to sepsis, there's less likely to be strictures or pouch failure. And that it's a, closing the loop ileostomy is a pretty simple procedure <coughs> with very low morbidity. Fewer patients needed a re-exploration. And some argue that since a percentage of these patients will go on to a permanent ileostomy, that it makes sense for them to experience an ileostomy so that if they are in that group that needs to eventually have a permanent ileostomy, they're not quite so fearful. The arguments against it are the patients would obviously prefer it both to avoid the ileostomy and to just have one operation. In some patients, either particularly overweight patients, the ileostomy may be technically difficult to fashion because we're limited by how much stretch we want to put that ileoanal anastomosis on. There is a, clearly a shorter total hospital stay and therefore less cost. And while ileostomy closure is a fairly simple procedure, it does have associated morbidity. There's also been a recent meta-analysis about this issue, and this looked at studies from 1978 to 2005 about 1,500 patients, and it covered, it, they were pretty evenly split into the patients who had, were diverted and patients who weren't. In this table, if it's greater than one, the odds, if the odds ratio is greater than one, it favors having a stoma. So you can see that there were, uh, it, clearly having a stoma is good in terms of avoiding a leak. Uh, it suggests there's a trend toward reducing pelvic sepsis or pouch-related sepsis, although that wasn't significant. Not too surprisingly, it goes the other way for anastomotic stricture. What is a little more surprising is that pouch failure is less in the patients who were not diverted compared to the patients who were diverted. That probably is an issue of patient selection, but is a pretty, it was a pretty consistent finding. 